Good morning, London. Thank you so much for agreeing to spend some time with us today. We realize what a commitment it is for you to be away for your teams for the day, and we really appreciate you being here. I personally am always quite excited and energized every time I get to come to London because I know I'll get to meet with some of Europe's most forward-thinking technology executives. And as Gavin said, like all of our events, today's summit is really a learning and development experience, much more than it is a sales and marketing conference. We're going to hold a handful of sessions today and many more tomorrow, covering a variety of topics for those of you with all levels of experience. And our goal is for everybody to leave here today with a much better understanding of how AWS can help you deliver results for your business. And in addition to these sessions, I'd, I'd also echo Gavin's comments and encourage you to spend some time networking with your peers today. There are almost a thousand companies represented here, many of whom are using technology in some really, really amazing ways and innovative ways to power their business. For anybody who thrives on innovation, uh, there's, there's no time like the present to start thinking about how you can differentiate your business using AWS. This marketplace growth has been really exciting for me to watch. When we started our journey at Dow Jones when I was uh, the CIO there in 2012, there wasn't nearly as many people in the ecosystem or customers using the platform, and it's really exciting to see it uh, explode. So it's safe to say that any modern day business transformation will largely be driven by technology. And we're seeing some patterns in how enterprise IT is evolving to be ideally positioned to drive these modern day challenges. GE, Capital One, Thomson Reuters, KPMG, SGN, and Informa are just a few of the organizations that are driving substantial business transformation powered by the cloud. Now, if you think about enterprise IT today, it tends to have well-established and sometimes functional compute virtualization, storage systems, network virtualization, and governance models that all need to be thought about in a slightly different way in a world where you have infinitely scalable and globally available IT resources. Now, as more and more companies realize this, they're also beginning to understand that running their own infrastructure typically does not help them meet their business goals. And on top of this, many large organizations are burdened with decades of technical debt, bureaucracy, politics, fear of change, and IT operating models that need to be slightly redesigned to take advantage of what the cloud has to offer. So today what we'll do is go over some of the patterns we're seeing in enterprises that are benefiting from the cloud. And I hope that everybody leaves with a better understanding of how the cloud can help you meet your business objectives at a pace that you're comfortable with that will accelerate over time and still allows you to take advantage of your existing investments. So first I'll give you a little bit about my background. I started my career as a developer and spent my first seven years at Bloomberg throughout a variety of development and leadership positions across their equity and messaging platforms. And in 2008, when the market took a turn for the worse, Bloomberg began investing in new businesses to drive diversified revenue streams into the organization. And I was very fortunate, I got together with some of my colleagues and we had this hypothesis that if we treated a professional athlete like an equity and a professional sports team like a portfolio and we applied the same sort of software and, and analytics that we had developed at Bloomberg on top of financial services data onto the rich amount of data that's now collected in professional sports, we could help professional sports teams manage their operations more effectively. And as Bloomberg made many of these types of investments, Bloomberg Law, Bloomberg Government, Bloomberg Wealth, Bloomberg Talent, we found that operating infrastructure on a mature business like the Bloomberg Terminal was no way to operate infrastructure on a bunch of new innovative startup businesses. We were spending many, many millions of dollars on making all of these, on, on infrastructure for all of these businesses and making the investments far less attractive than they should have been. So in 2011, I was asked to do something about this, and we developed a private cloud to create some efficiencies across all of these different lines of business. Now on one hand, we did make the costs much more attractive to each of the bit lines of business, but on the other, we still had far less features and were moving much more slowly than if we were able to take advantage of the pace of innovation that was then offered by AWS. All of my customers 
the CTOs of all of these different business units, were still relatively unhappy. Everybody felt that we would be much more nimble and better off if we were able to be served by the best in class tools made available by AWS and then devoting the resources on my team towards additional product development. I realized that we would never be able to keep up pace with AWS's pace of innovation and resigned to the idea that building a private cloud is not a good use of company resources. So when I became the CIO of Dow Jones in 2012, I knew not to make the same mistake. Now I'll talk about some of my experiences at Dow Jones throughout our conversation this morning, but I'll start by saying that in 2014, I had a moment of clarity. This whole cloud thing is inevitable. It became so obvious to me that companies should not be spending their scarce resources on activities like managing infrastructure that don't drive revenue into the business. In 2012, when we started our cloud journey, we had an awful lot of skeptics, both internally and externally, who some thought we were rather crazy for trying to use the cloud in a serious way for our business. We not only proved them wrong, but we surpassed even our own expectations. What we were able to accomplish because of AWS was nothing short of transformational. We went from 70% of our resources in the technology department focused on traditional IT operations to 70% focused on product development while reducing my budget each year and delivering features far faster than we ever had before. Now I certainly won't stand here and claim that things were perfect in enterprise IT. I have yet to see an organization where things are but we were definitely focusing more on what mattered and moving a lot faster. And while it's now in a different capacity, I'm still very fortunate to be able to help my colleagues at News Corp and Dow Jones and continue to be excited by the progress that they make. In just over three years, News Corp has migrated more than 50% of its IT to the cloud, has saved and rerouted more than $100 million in annual costs, and are now delivering more products faster than ever before. And now, I feel like I have the greatest job in the world. I get to take my experiences transforming enterprise IT, combine them with the experiences of other executives who are doing the same, and help IT executives and organizations all over the world be successful in transforming their business. Now what I'm seeing as every company starts to unlock the value that cloud has to offer, they find themselves having to ask one very important question. What if you could devote more resources to the things that matter most to your business while moving faster and being more secure? And we heard a little bit, some statistics from Gavin this morning about the folks in the room, and I'm willing to bet that just about everybody here is either already using the cloud in some way or is thinking about using it very soon. And I hear organizations cite all sorts of different reasons why they get started. Maybe you're looking to save money, Maybe you want to drive innovation, create a cultural change and drive innovation, expand globally. But eventually, the organizations that do this well realize that AWS is not just a collection of services, but it's a platform that allows you to devote more of your resources to your customers, move faster, and be more secure. So whatever your motivation is at the outset, most executives that I talk to agree that this is the question that pushes them to scale their adoption more broadly. And here's just a brief glimpse of the thousands of enterprises who are well on their way. In media, my alma mater, Dow Jones and News Corp, became cloud first and is migrating more than 50 of their data centers to AWS. Condé Nast, Hearst, the Financial Times are all undergoing similar transformations, as is The Guardian, who moved from 25 product releases in 2011 to more than 40,000 releases in 2014. This type of agility is just an absolute game changer for any kind of business. In healthcare, Novartis, Bristol Myers Squibb, Merck are all moving towards a DevOps model and automating their infrastructure across a growing number of their business units. Now some of these pharma companies have found the ability to run DNA sequ sequencing and drug simulations that would have re traditionally required them to build data centers costing tens of millions of dollars that they're now able to do for a few thousand dollars per experiment and spin down the infrastructure when they're not using it. 
in financial services, Capital One, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, ICAP, Thomson Reuters, and many others are using AWS to modernize their IT department and focus more and more of their resources on their businesses and their customers. Like The Guardian, ICAP is releasing product 20 times more often than they did last year and spending much more time obsessing over their customers rather than obsessing over their infrastructure. KPMG is reducing their infrastructure costs by 60%. TravelX, SGN, Tesco Bank, Aviva, and British Gas are just a few of the other enterprises here in the UK who are using AWS to focus more resources on their customers. When it comes down to it, every imaginable business segment is using AWS in a meaningful way. So to understand why so many enterprises are headed down this path, let's take a look at how enterprise IT is typically organized. Now every organization is going to be a little bit different or unique, but when I was a CIO, I tended to look at my organization as having five distinct parts. First, you have the products and services that drive revenue into your organization. This is typically different on an industry by industry basis. So if you're in financial services, this is your digital banking or your front office trading systems. If you're in media, this is your content delivery systems and your digital products. If you're in retail, this might be your point of sale systems, et cetera. Next to that, you have your back office systems, which is the technology you deploy to make your company operate effectively. Your ERP, your legal systems, <clears throat> your communication systems, et cetera. Next to that, you have your end user computing, sometimes called IT support, desktop management, mobile device management, and the technology that you give to your employees so that they can do their jobs effectively. Woven into everything that we do today as an IT professional is information security, and this is increasingly becoming the case over the course of the last decade or so. Now, if you were a startup or an enterprise that was just starting to grow, this might be the only four parts of technology that you might have in your organization. But what happens is enterprises start to get bigger and grow and want to scale globally. They tend to want to consolidate their buying power for technology in one place and abstract a lot of the complexities of their technology stack <clears throat> into one central unit because it's easier to do that well at scale. And so we see organizations creating these infrastructure and delivery organizations to do exactly that. And sometimes these infrastructure delivery organizations are further broken out or siloed by different functions where everybody is competing for resources from a single pool of talent. Now, this is sometimes an effective way of getting a large group of talent focused on one silo, but it also makes it quite difficult to manage challenging priorities across a complex enterprise portfolio. On top of this, infrastructure often, all too often becomes the lion's share of investment that uh, you're making in your organization and technology, which in my view is really at odds with good business sense. Really where you want to be spending most of your time and effort is on the product and services that drive revenue, not the infrastructure that looks the same in just about every organization. Now the all, uh, these other areas are all very important, and not doing them well can certainly hurt your business, but doing them marginally better than the competition is not likely to materially improve your results. Which is why we see so many enterprises moving towards this cloud-first model. So again, this is going to be slightly different in every organization, but this is the trend that we're seeing in organizations that do this really well. Information security continues to be something that weaves into all the different parts of IT. Back office systems and end user computing are now increasingly ins consumed as a service, where the hardware, software, and licensing are consumed all together, particularly, uh, typically on a per user or per month basis, which breaks their dependency on a traditional infrastructure and allows you as your organization to focus much more on the business processes that drive these parts of technology rather than the infrastructure underneath. Now, every organization that I've met with that is making a meaningful transformation using the cloud has some form of a cloud center of excellence, which is now emerging as a much more cost-effective and agile way to provide best practices, automation, and governance across all of IT. And because the back office systems and end user computing no longer rely on infrastructure, 
this team can focus almost exclusively on your business's products and services. And this transition frees up the precious resources to work on what matters most to your customers, the applications that drive your business. It's also worth noting that many of the organizations who are on this journey are using this transformation as a means to usher in a DevOps culture, where the cloud center of excellence and the product teams are working much more closely together. Application teams are taking an increasing amount of responsibility for running what they build, providing better customer service back to the business in the form of faster turnaround times and a better user experience, and leveraging automation to do all of this reliably and repeatably. Now, when I was at Dow Jones, we went so far as to name our Cloud Center of Excellence team DevOps and began to build a new career path for DevOps engineers. And I've now seen this role appear in several different large organizations now. And I'll touch a little bit more on how we did this in just a few moments. Now, we've seen this journey take place a number of times now. I've lived it at Dow Jones and News Corp, GE, Capital One, Hess, Qantas, Intuit, Samsung, Hearst, and thousands of others are well on their way. And through that experience, we've observed a pattern within organizations that are leveraging the AWS platform to transform their business. Not surprisingly, most enterprises start with a few projects to help them understand the business value and prove to themselves that they can solve real business problems using the cloud. Next, they set up a hybrid architecture and a cloud center of excellence to lay the foundation for their future delivery model. Once the hybrid architecture and the cloud center of excellence have been established, enterprises typically then scale their adoption across bus different business units, begin to consider and execute substantial migrations, and look for this as a real opportunity to start to retire some technical debt. Finally, <clears throat> we're seeing a lot of enterprises hit this tipping point where they become much more proficient in managing in their cloud environment than they do in their on-premises environment, and they can begin to optimize both their IT footprint and their business functions in light of the possibilities that have been created and opened from leveraging a cloud platform across their business. So to get started, you can leverage AWS just about anywhere in your organization. Two to three years ago, I'd say these projects tended to be driven by lines of business. But as the AWS portfolio grows, we're increasingly seeing projects being driven from within the central IT organization. I believe that this is because AWS has now more experience helping organizations with a more diverse set of their IT needs than any other cloud platform by a wide margin. When we work with customers, they tend to tell us about the additional parts of IT that they want our help with. And we've used those insights to drive our roadmap. 90% of our product roadmap is driven by exactly what our customers tell us that they need. Now, it goes without saying that we have a number of infrastructure and security services to help you with your most demanding compute, storage, database, networking, analytics, and information security needs. In the corporate application space, WorkDocs will let you share files across your organization. WorkMail is a secure and exchange compatible mail server in the cloud that allows you to control where in the world your content resides. In end user computing, workspaces will allow you to manage desktops for your workforce in the cloud. Imagine a world where IT support can be run entirely remotely and that with a click of a button, any employee in your organization can get a more powerful and fresh desktop for just a few dollars a month. Johnson & Johnson is using workspaces to enable tens of thousands of contractors to work in their environment without having to manage any of the devices. On top of this, the AWS marketplace has thousands of solutions across every single part of IT. We've taken the same concept that's helped Amazon.com exponentially grow its product inventory and allowed technology vendors to sell their AWS compatible solutions in the marketplace. This gives our customers a broad selection of solutions that they can deploy into their infrastructure in seconds. Nowhere else can you find an inventory of IT solutions this large, all of which 
can be procured in the same way that you procure AWS, which oftentimes reduces greatly bureaucratic procurement processes. Now what I hope that this picture illustrates is that AWS can make your entire IT organization more effective. It means really that you can start taking advantage of the cloud, of what it has to offer anywhere. And it should be driven by the needs of your business at that time. Chances are, once you start to realize the benefits in one area of your IT organization, you'll be able to leverage that learning to parlay and take advantage of it in others' parts over time as well. Now executives often ask me what types of projects they should get started with. Now we see enterprises get started with all sorts of different kinds of projects. When I was at Dow Jones, my CEO had this crazy idea. He said that the subscribers of the Wall Street Journal have much of the world's wealth, and the subscribers of Factiva and Dow Jones Newswires, our B2B businesses, manage much of the world's wealth. And if we could build a communications hub that sat in between those two platforms, we might be on to a new business line where we could help them do business with one another. So we put a team of engineers in a room and unencumbered by any of our existing processes, asked them to come up with something new. And within six weeks, using a handful of open source technologies, developing everything on AWS in a disaster indifferent and fault tolerant way, we had an application up and running that we could start to shop around to our business and some of our customers. This was faster than anybody in our organization had ever seen before, and we used that as our hero project to get many folks excited around the rest of the organization. At Johnson & Johnson, one of their early projects, which I just mentioned before, was their workspaces deployment across more than 26,000 of their seasonal workers. Many of the financial services firms that we work with today are looking to optimize their budgets, and we often start by helping them migrate their on-premises environments that they'd otherwise need to refresh or upgrade, saving them time and money as they learn how to leverage the platform. Now, whether you get started with a project like this or something else, we have a number of different programs that can help you get going. In addition to working with your account manager and solutions architects, we offer a robust set of training programs that cater to all roles across the enterprise, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. A marketplace that has ready-made solutions for many common business problems. And recently, we announced and launched a platform that we call AWS Answers on our website that contains reference architectures and answers to some of the most commonly asked questions we get from our customers. So to give you another good example of how a single project can lead to a cloud-first organization, I'd like to bring up somebody from one of the well, most well-known audit, tax, and advisory services organization to talk about their journey towards cost reduction, agility, and DevOps. Please help me welcome to the stage Nick Bellington from KPMG. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me first thank Stephen and, and Gavin for giving KPMG the chance to tell a little bit about our story. Um, I haven't got a slide that introduces myself at such length as Stephen have. In, indeed, if I did, it would cover all three screens. Uh, because when I started in this business, punch cards were the norm. And indeed, the only cloud you saw was if the bag split when you were emptying the machine with the punch card uh, shards as they went. But I'm take KPMG's head of technology. I have a team that have embraced cloud because we need to. Our clients are asking us to embrace cloud. At KPMG, we're offering our clients to address their client issues a range of solutions through a, a team who have, uh, we've put in place to bring them innovation. We're building assets which will drive their business, and we're doing the same to ourselves. And we have adopted a cloud-first strategy. I'm going to talk in a minute about uh, some of the projects or, or a key project that got us started off, because I understand that maybe half of you in the room are still thinking about it. But believe me, if an old timer like me, working for an organization that is quite risk adverse like KPMG, can build a team that's de delivering agile, innovative solutions running on the cloud to address client issues, can succeed in this business, all of you who are wavering and who haven't started yet can actually achieve the same. Why are we doing it? Well, we're doing it because we want to see innovation, and our clients are demanding more innovation, and speed to market. 
we're also doing it to reduce cost. Two years ago when I arrived at KPMG, I don't know if this story will resonate with you, but it typically took us between nine months and a year to implement a solution, mainly driven by infrastructure on the critical path, often driven by our risk management processes on the, critical, on the second critical path we were running for, and our costs were relatively high. So we were trying to innovate for clients, and our clients were demanding fast, innovative assets that they could deploy, but we were struggling to do so. And actually our clients themselves, and hopefully this will resonate with you as well, were finding the same when they went to their in-house IT departments. So we looked to change the game, and in changing the game, where we are now is we've not just brought agility to what we want to, what we want to do, we've also brought significant benefits in terms of cost. Between 50 or 70 percent cost reductions in the services that we're offering, which our clients again appreciate because we can pass on some of that value to them. So let's take a use case, and we've chosen for the use case an example of our first foray into cloud, because I think it will bring home some of the issues that you might face if you're doing the same thing. Our small business accounting offering was something that we decided we need to do about two years ago. KPMG traditionally has provided audit, bookmaking, uh, bookkeeping, tax and advisory services to some of the largest businesses in this country and some medium-sized enterprises. But the small to medium sector was one we really weren't servicing and we saw an opportunity if we could move first to get into the market, which is probably the market that's driven by the corner street accounting company at the moment, but do it in a way that's not just about bookkeeping, but also bring some of the value of our advice, some data and analytics and some other innovative technologies to change the way those businesses could succeed. But to do so, we had to move fast. And so we adopted from the outset that we decided that that project would run on the cloud and on the AWS cloud. At the heart of our solution is AWS, and then above that, some interesting technology portals and a third, for, third party accounting platform to drive the core of the business. And then that's backed off into KPMG's own operational functions in terms of some of the knowledge capability you have to deploy to actually uh, ensure tax and, and, and audit compliance with the sorts of services we're offering. And actually, I have to say to you, as soon as you adopt a cloud approach, you will find that the technology is no longer on the critical path. In fact, you can spin up these environments much more quickly then you can decide what to do with them. So getting it right actually demanded us to address some of our own internal processes and to think a little bit more about security, to think a little bit more about our risk management processes. First time through, and please don't be put off by this statistic, it took us nine months to get approval to run our SBA, our small business accounting service on the cloud. The reason you shouldn't be put off by that is once you've been through that journey, and educated your risk teams and your security teams, you can cut that time down. We now reckon at the fastest about two weeks to get risk approval for a new production service on the, on the cloud, typically between four and six weeks, depending on the data that we're, we're, we're holding. And it's the data that is key. And this is where services like AWS, and AWS in particular, help us. I'll just talk about two features that are very key to us in terms of the way that we see risk and security with the AWS solution. The first is the fact that it's a federated model. We know where our data is. Now, we've chosen to house all our data in the EU at the moment. I'm very pleased that Gavin's talking about uh, uh, the UK because we do seem to have a theme of going back to the 70s at the moment, not least me speaking to you today. So if we, you know, if we have to move to the UK, we will, but we use AWS's services to know where our data is and our risk officers like that. The second key feature is that security and risk people actually really appreciate knowing what's going on with encryption and the, and the security of your data in some very, very uh, <coughs> key ways. We use some of the services that Amazon offer that allow us to take ownership of our encryption keys. And in fact, even Amazon don't have access to our encryption keys, so we can shut down our services if we need to. And that's been pretty key in shortening the timeline. Depending on what, what use cases you're running, you will have other issues. There's a wealth of things in the Amazon uh, catalog that you can use, but those are just two of the things which were pretty key to us in terms of getting this going. Where are we today? Well, SBA actually has surprised us a little. We're running many tens of thousands of, of clients over our, uh, our SBA service. It's been a success. Um, and the, therefore, the thing that surprised us is we've been able to tap into the scalability of the cloud as well as we've gone. Because what's happened is we're not just selling our small business accounting offering to individual clients. So we're not just seeing a gradual growth of take up. But actually, on a white label basis, some very large organizations are now buying it 
And so we're seeing chunks of 40, 50, 60,000 users that we need to bring to our infrastructure at a point in time. And without the cloud, I think we'd be struggling with those old processes of nine to 12 month lead times to stand up servers and infrastructure, security approvals, and all of that cost that's in there. So an, an additional benefit that, we, that we've seen coming from, from, our, from our service. So let me just close and say a few things about uh, where we are. Uh, for those in the room that are on the journey, hopefully this, this resonates with you. For those who are just starting the journey, um, I would get with the program if I were you. I think it's very beneficial in terms of what to do. First of all, you just need a project to get started. It is going to be a bit of a tough journey, that first project. There are people that will stand in your way, like the risk, security people, or indeed access to the right technical skills and mindset. But stay with it, stick with it, educate them, because they will soon embrace this too. Where we stand today, we're very similar to the chart that uh, Stephen put up, we moved very quickly from our first project into a lot of DevOps, a lot of development environments that we were running, which were easy to get through risk approvals. But now we're very much in the world where we're running multiple numbers of production services, holding a, a range of different pieces of data and offering a range of bits of functionality to our clients. There's over 25 live today, and my dedicated cloud ops team are probably the most popular team in, Cape, in the building with KPMG amongst my partners, because they all want some of this. They've drunk the Kool-Aid, or they've got other partners who've drunk the Kool-Aid, and their clients are demanding it. They're popular, they're overworked, and it's a growing skill that we're now trying to push out to the rest of the business. I mentioned DevOps, uh, and I think that will come back a lot today. Adopting DevOps principles is another conclusion that we've, we've, reached to, uh, we've reached. Unless you take a different mindset to this from the traditional mindset, you won't succeed. But if you do all of those things, you will indeed see agility, innovation, and lower cost. That's all I had to say today. Stephen, thank you. Thank you, Nick. So great to see all the innovative things that you're doing to help both small and large businesses, and we're really glad to be a part of it. I really like the taking technology out of the critical path. I thought that was a, a great quote. So once an organization begins to understand exactly how the cloud can help them focus on what matters most and move more quickly, we typically see some foundational investments so that the organization can begin to codify best practices so that they can then later scale that benefit to additional business units. Now, if you ask any CIO who has been successful in using the cloud to transform their business, they'll tell you that they've created some sort of DevOps or Cloud Center of Excellence team to serve as the fulcrum by which they transform the rest of the organization. Now, these Cloud Center of Excellence teams are becoming responsible for deploying cloud capabilities across the organization while creating and managing the guardrails that your business and organization requires as you transform. And as you can see from this evolving IT map, the Cloud Center of Excellence team will start to usher in a hybrid architecture that allows organizations to extend their on-premises IT environments to the cloud so that you can take advantage of both at the same time. AWS is not an all or nothing value proposition, and we have more experience than any other provider aimed at helping organizations create a hybrid environment that works for them. Now, I don't know about you, but in my experience, infrastructure and app teams don't always play nicely together. App teams can sometimes think that infrastructure moves too slow. Infrastructure teams can some teams sometimes think that the app teams are cowboys and don't understand production. Now this system of checks and balances can sometimes be healthy, but I've also seen it become toxic. Now because cloud services remove much of the friction traditionally associated with enterprise IT, you can use your journey as an opportunity to revisit this dynamic and focus on building a cloud center of excellence that's much closer to delivering business value while still maintaining guardrails and best practices that your organization can depend on. Now, I like to see these Cloud Center of Excellences start off as a zero-sum investment where the organization moves existing headcount from a diverse set of roles and backgrounds to create a team with a strong cross-functional cross point of view. This team should be responsible for helping your organization navigate your journey while unlocking business value and time to market, 
by leveraging a platform that takes away much of the undifferentiated heavy lifting underneath. Now, when we created my DevOps team at Dow Jones, which ended up being our center of excellence, we started with just five people from a number of different backgrounds, a sysadmin, a network engineer, a DBA, a developer, and our enterprise architect to lead it. And we gave our team three core tenets. One, they needed to be customer service oriented. I wanted everybody in the organization to come to me and tell me what a great pleasure it was to work with the DevOps organization. And they're going to go back and work with them again because they want to and got great service, not just because I told them to. And then I told them to. To automate everything, it's pretty well understood that in order to get, uh, take advantage of the elasticity that the cloud has to offer, you need to be able to reliably reproduce your systems using scripting and code. And we started off by automating everything that we were building in our DevOps organization. And finally, to be this center of excellence, where we were pushing the responsibility of the ongoing operations and running of what our applications team, application teams built onto the application teams. And here's a set of objectives that I encourage every cloud center of excellence to consider as they move through this foundational stage. First, think about and create the right hybrid, architre ar hybrid architecture strategy for your investments. Second, look to identify some commonalities in the various systems that your organization builds and operates and start to develop some reference architectures that use automation and continuous integration to bake in security and agility as first class citizens rather than as afterthoughts. Next, to find the different types of roles and identity management strategies across the different types of platforms and tools that you're going to use. Fourth, develop mechanisms to govern uh, and optimize costs. Now, there's a number of different strategies and tools available to help you implement enterprise requirements like business unit chargebacks, forecasting and budgeting, and making sure that you're taking advantage of reserved instances to optimize your spend over time. And finally, use your Cloud Center of Excellence to usher in a robust set of training materials to enable all of the different business units in your organization be successful with the best practices, approaches, and tools that your Cloud Center of Excellence team is developing for the rest of the organization. And for those of you who want some help on this, you can check out my blog on Medium. I recently finished a series on what it's like to create a Cloud Center of Excellence. You can also check out the AWS Cloud Adoption Framework, which is freely available on our website. And you can talk to your account teams about enrolling in our well-architected program, where our solutions architects will work with you on one or more of your applications to look at and suggest architecture improvements. No other cloud platform has anywhere near the technical capabilities or experience that AWS has in helping enterprises set up a hybrid architecture. Now that application I talked to you about that we first built at Dow Jones, pretty quickly when we wanted to get that out the door, we had to have that talk to our identity system, which ran in our data centers and was not at the moment publicly exposed to the internet. So our engineers had to figure out how to get this application that we were running in the public cloud to talk to something that we had behind our firewalls internally. Our engineers sat down with some of the documentation around Amazon VPC, figured out how they would map the security groups to our firewall rules, took a snapshot of all the instances that we were running in the public cloud, brought them up within our VPC so that they could get IP addresses within our subnet, started to route traffic between um, our, the, the application that was running in the public cloud and now it was running in our, in our VPC and finished that migration in about 45 minutes with zero downtime. I don't know about you, it's a modest migration, but a data center migration nonetheless. Doing a migration in 45 minutes was eye-opening, but more eye-opening was that we were now able to take advantage of some of the systems and software that we were running inside of our data centers while still taking advantage and having them communicate to our applications running in the cloud, which was our big aha moment for how we can now do this across the rest of our organization. Now, a lot of executives ask me how long they'll be running in a hybrid environment. Now, I believe that any organization who's been running their own IT environment for any substantial period of time will have a hybrid architecture as part of their journey. And we'd probably count that time in years. But it's hard for me to imagine a future 10 years from now 
where an organization of any size will be running their own data centers. I think that AWS's pace of innovation and how much easier we're making it to migrate, which I'll touch upon shortly, is only accelerating this transformation. Now you heard a little bit about this from Nick earlier. Most of the enterprises that we work with who are successful and ushering in any real transformation and innovation across their business do so by bringing their stakeholders along with them. Every organization is a little bit different, but this usually means evangelizing and building support across finance, legal, procurement, security, compliance, and other different functions. Now I view building this type of support as a foundational investment because it's only going to help you scale the benefits across your organization much more quickly. Some of the executives that we work with are using these campaigns as a way to rebrand their IT departments as innovators. They're finding ways to merge business with technology, provide clarity of purpose to their teams and to their stakeholders, and aren't afraid to revisit the old way of doing things. So to talk to us a little bit more about how Scotia Gas Networks approached their journey and built this internal support, I'd like to welcome Paul Hannon to the stage. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, I'm always excited about the opportunity to talk to, to people about what SGN is doing, what we're trying to achieve, and why we're trying to, to do that. And it's the role of technology, as, as Stephen said, as an innovator and enabler to, to business change. So I just wanted to start, first of all, by explaining who SGN are, because some of you may not, might, may not know the company. Um, we're a gas distribution company. We manage the transmission of gas from National Grid's main transmission out, um, line out to our customers' meters. And we manage that service throughout Scotland and in the south of England. So we have about 4,000 people working for us. We manage the network. We make sure it's reliable. We um, provide an emergency service. If um, you smell gas, you, you, you call National Helpline and we'll be out within an hour to make sure that, that everything is safe. But driven by uh, a very forward-thinking executive team and CEO, but also a very forward-thinking regulator, SGN's now placing a much more significant emphasis around customer service, around our use of technology. So SGN was recently recognized as the number one gas distribution network for customer service. We've won awards for our work around robotics. We've won our awards for our work around um, application development, particularly in the mobile space, because we have a very large mobile workforce. And the image that you see up on the screen of the man looking down the pipe is an example of our SysBot robot, um, a robot that we're currently working to um, develop its ability to monitor, inspect the inside of our gas pipelines without the need to, to dig up roads and inconvenience everybody. So um, we manage roughly 74,000 kilometers of pipe. We're, like KPMG, a very risk-adverse organization. Our annual turnover is in excess of a billion pounds a year to give you an idea of the sort of scale of company that we are. Um, I would have given that in dollars as well for our American colleagues, but I think over the last week or two, that value's gone down quite a bit. So um, we'll just stick with pounds at the moment. So SGN has a business strategy that focuses very much, not only on its, its critical um, regulated business, but also in terms of growing its non-regulated business, its commercial business. And when we looked at that strategy from an IT perspective, and we looked at our current estate, we realized that we've got a few challenges there. SGN's got an estate that is very reliable, but it's expensive. It's very good at doing what it's been doing for the last 10 years. Um, we've invested a lot of capital in it. But frankly, we don't get the maximum benefit out of that estate. 
We did some analysis at the start of this journey and we found about 75% of our IT estate, our infrastructure, offers no persistent business value. So all those development systems, UAT systems, fit testing systems, pre-prod systems, passive pre-prod systems, frankly, they're, they're sitting there soaking up money, acting as a, a liability in terms of the estate that we need to manage when we're not using them actively. So we thought there must be a better way of doing this. Um, we, we have a highly complex, non-consistent estate, and that creates challenges in terms of managing security. Again, we found that a majority of our internal security alerts were caused by inconsistent configuration, inconsistent builds. People meaning well, but doing things in a slightly different way every time or an inconsistent way each time. We also found that we were managing our suppliers, our estates, in a very admin-heavy way. We, we had big, long contracts. We were managing um, services where we had to manage to KPIs. We were buying software that, frankly, we were finding that we weren't getting benefit from, but we still had shelves full of this, this investment. So that's going to cause a really big challenge to us in terms of trying to grow our non-regulated business, trying to work with the innovation and technology that the business is demanding. So we wrote a new IT strategy, a new technical strategy that focused around a cloud-first environment. And that wasn't born out of any focus that cloud technology is cool or interesting. It was born out of cold, hard economics. It was based upon our business strategy and it was focused on making sure that we could deliver what the business needs. So we ran a regulated tender, as we have to in SGM, because we're primarily a regulated company, and we selected AWS, which, given most of the people here, probably isn't a surprise to you guys that it's a market leader. But when we looked at the various platforms, the, the availability of the marketplace was a fundamental deciding factor for us. The pace of change in terms of new services constantly onboarding was a deciding factor for us. So we worked with AWS, we took enterprise support, we signed our agreement, our enterprise agreement, which we did in three weeks, not three months, like we normally have to do with negotiating contracts, and we use AWS professional services. And because we're a regulated company, we're now going out to tender for migration of all of our business services into either a SaaS platform or into AWS. And we're looking for those partners to help us work in that highly automated, zero trust, zero, trust, zero touch environment. We're working on the principle of rationalizing our estate down from roughly about 2,000 servers that we manage at the moment down to about 200, where we focus on running production workloads and we create non-production workloads on demand. So it's a massive change in the way that we deliver IT. Um, it hasn't been a smooth adoption from the very beginning, but we've done a lot to achieve a vast amount in a very short amount of time. We've gone from the initial inception of a technical strategy on a cloud-first to board approval, board funding, having run a regulated tender within an eight-month period. And in a regulated company, a risk-adverse company, that, that's pretty much unheard of to go through that pace. And that was delivered by selling the benefits of this approach, not selling the technology. And part of the reason you see these kind of images is th this approach was born out of trying to make sure that we are speaking to people who, who, who don't want to understand the technology, who don't need to understand the technology, they, they want to see the benefits, they want to understand what it's giving to them. So the four key areas we focused on selling were improving security and improving um, durability. Those were the primary factors for us as SGN. It's, it's absolutely critically important operational availability. We then focused around agility um, in order to drive that commercial aspect um, of our business strategy, we need the ability to think like a startup. 
I really like Nick's comments in the, the KPMG deck about removing technology from the critical path. For us, the way we saw cloud was actually reducing the barriers of entry. We've had examples where, um, and I'll, I'll mind back a moment, um, where um, we've been unable to get innovative projects through our investment committee because IT has been so expensive in terms of buying licenses, building infrastructure, supporting that. And when I asked our MD of Scotland what he thought of IT, and he said, IT just come to me with problems, come to me with expense. I want IT to do something clever. What we did was go and look at some of those innovative projects. We had one around um, predictive analytics for our workforce in terms of looking at depot structures and so forth. And rather than trying to come in asking for lots of money for licenses and infrastructure, we came in with the service. Very low cost, running in AWS. It's built ready for us. We can consume that, we can run with it, and if we don't like it, we can turn it off again. So it reduced the barriers of entry, and it meant that a project that we tried to get through five times, driven by the business, went through straight away. And it's an IT project that's now run by the business, because the business don't need to worry about the infrastructure and the complexity. So cloud offered us a huge amount of um, benefit there. The other things we did to speed the adoption was we developed an independent investment case. We had one of the UK's leading IT consultancies come in and develop that business case for us. It meant that when we went to the board, we weren't talking about technology. We were talking about the commercial investment case. Um, we spent a lot of time working with legal, working with procurement, working with risk management, running proof of concepts in IT to demonstrate how this could work. And um, when I was doing this pack, I, I was going to um, show an image out of um, Clockwork Orange where they, they kind of pin the guy's eyes open to make sure he's, he's listening. Um, and that's fundamentally what we had to do with procurement and legal. We sat them down and we wouldn't let them go until all of their questions were answered, till they understood what we were doing, why we were trying to do it, and they actually adopted and became believers in, in the way that we are operating. We found our business have, have been far more um, adoptive of, of cloud technology in many ways than IT. And I think that's because IT see it as sometimes a risk, a, a challenge to their governance, a challenge to their um, place at the table when the business can go out and consume services in the cloud, they can work with AWS and so forth. But what we're now finding is it's actually a wonderful opportunity for those in our IT departments that want to start adopting this way of working, want to start thinking in this way. And again, we're seeing in SGN part of that award-winning capability in terms of um, the award that we won for mobile application development is because people are thinking in that DevOps mindset. They're starting to think in the, we built it, we run it we will continuously change and adapt and work with the business. So I just wanted to round up on a couple of sides. I wanted to talk about um, the benefits of working with AWS. And, and again, I think all of you guys know and understand about the, the value of the technology and about how AWS is, is the market leader in terms of infrastructure as a service platform as a service platforms. But for us, the two real key things that stood out as a benefit was how much AWS believe in their platform themselves. And when we spoke to our CEO and we explained the business model that you don't have to commit you know, to a five-year contract with AWS. You don't have to commit to a significant upfront spend. He was struggling to understand the business model to a degree, but when, when AWS and ourselves explained that AWS are confident that you'll stick with them as a customer because you believe it's the best platform, you're getting the most value out of that platform, that commercial model really underpins their belief in the value of the platform, and it's what we're seeing as well. But also, AWS and the team that work with us have been very collaborative. 
they're an agent of change for SGN. They're a disruptor. They always challenge us in terms of, are we thinking the right way? And in terms of the visual, I'd, I'd just add that SGN are the, the, guy, the, the dog on the keyboard, not the, the small robotic automated one. Um, but they've, they've been a great partner for us. So finally, SGN and view AWS as a strategic partner. We are absolutely adopting the approach of all in now. I know there's a lot of talk about hybrid infrastructures and about migrating dev test. From an SGN perspective, our view is it's, it's less risk, there's less cost, there's less issue of actually running a committed get everything across to the cloud than it is to try and run that hybrid estate for a period of time. So we're, we're absolutely all in with cloud. We're absolutely all in with AWS. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot. Great job. Thank you, Paul. Goes to show you how important it is to bring your stakeholders along with you. And I think I've just got the, uh, to add it to my bag of tricks, SGN and the clockwork orange approach. So I really appreciate that, Paul. Uh, so for those of you who feel that you're going to need to travel a similar path with your internal stakeholders and in bringing them along, please let us know. And we'd love to understand and partner with you to find the best way to help you in being successful. So this brings us to the migration stage where things really will start to change and a large portion of your IT estate will likely begin to migrate towards cloud services. The back office systems and end user computing typically move towards this SaaS model and start to break their dependency on needing internal IT investment to operate. These functions will change substantially as this happens and will allow your IT personnel to focus on the business processes associated with this, these functions rather than on the infrastructure underneath. And as your cloud center of excellence grows, more projects will be scoped for the cloud, more functions can be automated, and the investment and footprint of your on-premises infrastructure will continue to shrink, which will allow you to funnel those resources back into your products and services. Now it's during this stage where we see a lot of enterprises migrate large portions of their IT estate into the cloud. When we were about 16 or 18 months into our journey at Dow Jones, I had a data center in Hong Kong that we had a colo investment in that was going to go away in about two months. So we had eight weeks or so to get out. So we challenged the team to figure out how we could use our cloud center of excellence to, to migrate that over. And we started to relent a little bit on our automate and optimize everything tenant that we had established in the beginning. And the team finished that migration within six weeks. And one of the things that was really interesting about that migration is we had a uh, Citrix load balancer and a Radware WAN accelerator that were hardware components that ran as part of that data center and the infrastructure we ran there that the team thought were just critical components uh, that we needed to, to keep that data center alive. One of the DevOps engineers on my team went to the AWS marketplace and found that Citrix and Radware were leasing the exact same versions of that load balancer and WAN accelerator on top of EC2 instances in the marketplace, spun those instances up, downloaded the config files from our hardware, loaded it up to, to instances now running in the cloud, and we finished that migration without having to change any of our ongoing operations or spend any additional dollars on buying new hardware to manage the transition. And when we were done, we realized that on top of that, we saved about 40% in our ongoing run rate to keep that data center alive in the Tokyo region in AWS versus running it in a colo, <clears throat> which led to us forming the business case to help News Corp consolidate from 56 data centers down to six, saving $100 million a year in the process. But we had to learn how to do this largely on our own and pulled it off, relying exclusively on our own experience up until that point. The market's come an awful long way since then, and there's a number of patterns, people, and tools that are making this easier and easier than ever before. These patterns and people services and tools that are now available comes from AWS's experience helping more enterprises migrate to AWS than any other cloud provider has migrated by a wide margin. 
My former colleagues at News Corp has migrated well over half of their estate to AWS, saving more than $100 million in annual costs and increasing their agility in the process. Hess decided to spin off a bunch of their business units, migrated the assets through their Cloud Center of Excellence to AWS for each business unit, and the acquisition meeting where the company was acquiring the IT assets was literally a handing over of the AWS account keys. Wilmar, Kaplan, Delaware North, AOL, Intuit, Philips, and hundreds of others of enterprises are seeing similar results through their data center consolidation and migration projects. And using this experience, we've developed a mental model that illustrates the different phases that we've seen most cloud migra migrations go through. We're using this mi migration process to codify the best practices, tools, and partners that you can use to help your enterprise of all shapes and sizes pull off large migrations that deliver business value to your company and to your customers faster and faster. First, our account teams and partners work with customers to understand the opportunity and understand the value proposition. As an example, we're working with one of the largest companies in North America on a business case to migrate uh, their dev and test environment to AWS. They're a very large company. They've got about 10,000 developers worldwide. 2,000 of those developers are going to be touched and involved in this migration. And collectively, we believe that each of those 2,000 developers will be roughly 50% more productive because they won't have to wait for infrastructure and have a, a wide variety of services at their disposal to use once they're trained on and have migrated these systems to AWS, which means that at the end of this migration, they're going to have 1,000 extra developer man years than they had each year, where they can then spin up 100 new projects of 10 people each to find their next new business unit. And lots of other organizations are approaching their migrations and their business cases in a similar way. Next, we work with customers to dis deploy discovery tools that help them understand their IT portfolio, the dependencies between applications, and begin to consider what types of migration st strategies, which I'll touch upon in a moment, that they'll employ. And the third and fourth phase, the focus moves from the portfolio level to the individual application level. And there we work with customers to design, migrate, and validate each application according to one of the migration strategies. And finally, these migrations now land in a modern operating model that either leverages the new wave of managed services and partnerships that have been created over the years or that the customer is managing based on their experience getting to this point. And I encourage you to check out a couple of the sessions that we have later this afternoon, one on TCO talking about the opportunity evaluation and another on land and, and the new landing zone talking about the, um, the new operating model. So once some of the basic discovery and assessment has been done, each application migration tends to follow one of six paths, which we call the six R's. They include rehosting, sometimes called lift and shifting. And we find that in most migration projects, enterprises end up wanting to lift and shift a little bit more than half of their environment. GE Oil and Gas, for instance, found that even without implementing any cloud optimizations, they could save roughly 30% of their costs by rehosting and learned how to operate them through their team along the way. We find that most of this rehosting can be automated with tools, though in some cases customers will prefer to do this manually as they learn how to apply their legacy systems to the platform. Next you have replatforming. I sometimes call this lift, tinker, and shift. Maybe you're changing a little bit about the application, but not otherwise fundamentally changing the architecture. We see a lot of customers here, for instance, moving from, let's say, WebLogic, where you have a Java container that's under a licensing model, to, let's say, Tomcat, where it's open source and free, and you can save uh, some money along the way. Next, you have repurchasing. It's commonly kind of moved to this as a service model and no longer need to license on-premises software that you're running. Of course, you have refactor, or looking how you can uh, change and optimize your application to take advantage of all the features and elasticity, scalability, et cetera, that are now available uh, at your disposal in the cloud. We find that as much as 10 to 20% of a typical enterprise IT portfolio can simply be retired 
once some basic discovery is done and the organization realizes that nobody actually owns or operates these things anymore. And then of course the six R is, is retain or, or decide to, to do nothing for whatever reason. So to help you scale your transformation and migrations, we've got a number of different people resources to help you along your way. AWS's professional services team is available to work alongside your teams and partners to help set you up for a long-term sustainable operating model. And our professional services team is now driving most of the migration expertise that I've already covered in some of our other engagements. Now as a CIO, I always looked at the EA as a license to use whatever the vendor offered and support as my insurance policy against that license. But with AWS support, it's much more than just an insurance policy. It's also access to our technical account managers who will work with you to deeply understand your environment and help you optimize it over time. We're also working with more than a dozen cloud competent partners to create joint offerings that are accelerating migrations for all enterprises around the globe and I encourage you to meet with some of them who are here today. We've also got a number of tools to help you automate your migrations for even your most demanding workloads. Just to highlight a few, AWS Snowball is a 50 terabyte storage appliance with security baked in so that we can ship it to you. You can load it up with large amounts of data, change the shipping label using the Kindle attached to the front, and ship it back to us to load up into your AWS environment. Who would have thought that FedEx in the mail is still faster than networks in some cases? The AWS Database Migration Service is a simple to use service that supports the migration of most commercial and open source database platforms to and from AWS, either targeting our fully managed database as a service offerings or allowing you to continue to run your databases on top of EC2. The AWS VM import and export tool allows you to migrate your virtual machines to AWS. And the AWS Marketplace offers more than 2,750 tools, products, and services that you can deploy in seconds to help you with your most demanding migration and future state operating model needs. Of the 23 categories that are available in the AWS Marketplace, these six, security, networking, databases, business intelligence, storage, and media, are the ones most often adopted by our customers as they migrate workloads. Many of the products will allow you to bring your own license, while many others also offer a free trial so that you can try them before you buy. We're also working with a number of tool providers that are helping organizations automate some or all of the migration process. This list highlights a few of our partners, like Risk Networks, Cloudomize, Dynatrace, and New Relic, and you can expect to see their offerings continue to mature over time. So to give us a little bit more color of how a large global organization is approaching their migration to AWS, I hope that you'll all help me welcome Chris Richardson of Informa to the stage. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning. As we talked about before, it's a little dark in here, um, so I can't see all of you, but hopefully you can all hear me. Um, for those of you who are wondering where the accent's from, uh, I'm a New Zealander, I'm an American citizen, and I live in London. So everyone who voted, you can probably understand where I was uh, two, years, two weeks ago when we went through the votes. Um, I'm the CDO for Informa. Uh, I run the Enterprise Technology Services Group. And so when Stephen talked about which part of the organization I manage, uh, we manage the infrastructure and the end user computing services. So in terms of a little bit about Informa, uh, we're an information and knowledge company. Uh, we're now in the FTSE 100. Uh, we have 6,500 employees. We cover 20 countries in terms of where our offices are. Um, of those, we have 120 offices to manage. The 
way that we're organized is that we have four commercial divisions facing the market. Uh, we're in 60, we have customers in 60, 60 countries. Um, so we're a truly global business and that offers its own unique challenges. In terms of what we do, uh, we're the number one academic publisher. We're also the number one conference producer. Um, we have 2,000 different events. Um, and then we have over 100 uh, digital subscription products. In terms of our exhibition space, we cover over a million square meters, for those of you from Europe, um, in terms of exhibition space. And we operate in a number of different markets. So all of these things um, present its own challenges to the technology groups that support this. So we live in some interesting times. There's a number of changes always going on, and Inform has gone through some of those. We have a new CEO. We have a new management group. I think all of you will recognize what that means to technology when you have new groups of people asking for different things. So in terms of what we need to do, we need to improve our time to market. We need to increase our agility scale uh, and availability. Um, we need to focus on product development and product delivery versus our infrastructure. Um, and ultimately, we need to support the global footprint. So what technology did is we looked at what we do and we looked at a set of principles that help support Informa going forward. So the underlying premise for Informa today is customer first, technology fast. And what that means for technology is that we have to be quicker. We have to deliver faster. We have to be more agile. And those sort of words are easy to say, but how do you actually do them? So when we looked at that, we thought about who are our partners today? Who can we align with? If we're going to be cloud first, what do we need to do to change that? So some of our previous speakers talked about the things that they went through in order to convince an organization that cloud is the way forward. I won't cover that, but it did take nine to 12 months. It does take a lot of work to, for that to happen. But once you get there, then you're looking at what's the right supplier? Who's the right partner for you? Amazon has been the right partner for Informa for many years now. Um, we've gone through a number of migrations and a number of changes, and we've only really just started. So one of the big things that we've had to go through is how do we connect on-premise data centers to the cloud? How do we work through those types of changes that allow us to migrate traditional technology workloads into a cloud environment? So, We've connected two or three um, cloud data centers to our environment um, through Direct Connect. We went through the same types of challenges in terms of architecting that. But today, we now have 120 offices connected to the cloud. We have another 18 data centers that we still own and manage connected to the cloud. But moving workloads is a lot easier than it used to be. So what we've achieved at the moment is that we've migrated our US, Europe, and Asia data centers into AWS. We have them connected. All of the service that they provide, we have them connected to our offices. We have them connected to our customers. And from a, t from a colleague perspective, they don't really notice the difference. In terms of the migrations that we went through, the last data center transition that we made took nine months, and that sounds like a long time. But most of that work was actually identifying what needed to move and what didn't. And when we talked about the burn rate, how much of that technology did we need to move, we found that 50% of those server workloads that were in one of those data centers didn't need to move. We actually just removed those from our infrastructure footprint. But until you go through that time or you go through that work, you don't actually realize what's being used and why it's being used, because you've inherited this infrastructure that's 10 or 15 years old. Other things that we've looked at and other things that we've had to do is accelerate our experimentation. 
So one of the things that is now available for our development groups is a new data center. We spin those things up and down almost at will. If we have new um, development partners who are performing or bringing in a new product, then we put them in an environment where they can play and experiment. And after they've completed that work, we then look at how we transition them into production. But all of that is not managed by our technology group. We put the partners where they need to be, and then we let them experiment. And previously, when we had to do that, that took months to work through. The friction that comes between an operations group and a development group that we sort of highlighted before, um, words like toxic gets used because those things, we're looking at what do we have and can we make sure that the development groups are using what they need and that they're secure and at the same time they're always wanting something more, they're always wanting a change. And that type of um, methodology or mentality uh, was difficult in the old way of working. So other things that we looked at, we now have codified um, our traditional DC footprints. So it now goes from weeks to hours in AWS. Previously, it would take us a long time to stand up a data center. So if we look at some of the previous benefits, that, some of the benefits we're now expecting, data center provisioning took six to 18 months previously. Once we first moved, it took 38 to 60 hours because people were actually working through and using Amazon, using the console and making those changes. Now that we've codified that, it takes three to four hours to stand up a data center. Not just a server, but a data center. Um, in terms of comparison around new services, we've gone from four to six weeks. Typically that four to six weeks, uh, most of that is in terms of CapEx approval. I'm sitting on about three or four CapEx approvals now that um, still haven't gone through. With the cloud, it's taking 30 to 60 minutes. When we compare our old VMware estates to the new cloud services, one to two hours versus 30 to 60 minutes, there isn't a real change. But in terms of giving new environments to our development groups, that's where we're seeing most of our savings. When we talk about ag agility and experimentation, we have true agile life cycles now. Um, and the future just looks a little better and a little brighter for the way that we operate with our development groups. Lastly, I just wanted to talk about what's next. So Informa as a FTSE 100 business needs to focus on its customers and make sure that the knowledge and intelligence that we provide to them actually deliver profitable growth for them as well as us. In terms of what we're looking to do from a technology perspective, we're looking to migrate the rest of our data centers. We have another 10 plus data centers to move, and so that's the next stage of our journey. In terms of our architectural processes, we're looking to make sure that the way that we design and develop infrastructure services are different now than the, the way they used to be. The cloud center of excellence is something that started at Informa. It's something that we need to do from a capabilities perspective because although we have the technology, we might not have all of the knowledge and expertise to perform these functions. So that's one of the things that we're focused on next. And then the last piece, true mobility around um, desktop. Because we manage the desktop and because our global workforce is so mobile, we want to make sure that we're not constrained to the devices that they have today. That if someone needs to move or operate from home, they just spin up a new workspace in Amazon. So there are a few of the things that we've gone through at Informa. Um, the types of conversations that we have now amongst our technology group and the types of things that we talk to the board about are different. And so the challenge to everyone out there is that we will always have conversations about technology, but the conversation's different, and to me, it's much more exciting. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chris. It's great to see how fast you've made progress enabling your business. So finally, 
as enterprises migrate an increasing uh, portion of their IT portfolio to the cloud. <clears throat> they find that they're better at running systems in the cloud than they are on premises. And they end up flipping the burden of proof away from why should we use cloud for each of our projects and initiatives to why shouldn't we use cloud for everything in our business. And here are just a few of the organizations who have found themselves on the other end of this transition and are now implementing everything in their business that they do in the cloud. These include my alma mater, Dow Jones, News Corp, Suncorp Australia, Time Inc., Intuit, SGN, Splunk, IMS Health. And my personal favorite quote comes from Charles Phillips, the CEO of Infor, who said that friends don't let friends build data centers. So to give us a little bit more color on their journey taking a large financial services organization towards cloud first, I'm delighted to welcome Bore Vessel from ICAP to the stage. Thank you, Stephen. So um, I would assume most of you don't really know ICAP. So, ICAP doesn't really deal with kind of the, the end consumer. We're um, um, one of the world's largest interdeal brokers. So we're basically the mediator between institutional clients when, when they're trading. We've been in business for about 30 years. We, we turned 30 this year. Uh, we have offices in about 32 locations uh, or countries, and then we have about 60 offices uh, globally. We're a FTSE 250 company, and uh, we're uh, mainly London and New York based. So, uh, in terms of ICAP, we've always been a company which has um, kind of taken technology very seriously. And in recent years, we've invested quite a lot in, in fintech companies. Kind of internally, that hasn't necessarily been the case. And kind of, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to look at the cloud. So the cloud, for us, is one of the most important things going forward. In terms of our migration, um, there were a few reasons why we wanted to, why we chose Amazon. Main reason was the, the business wanted agility. We couldn't provide agility on the current platform that we had. Kind of, if you look at the internal data centers, they didn't really move very fast. The business always felt that they were kind of waiting and waiting and waiting for technology to deliver what they were promising. So the partnership with the business in this whole process has been very, very good, very open, and very supportive. Security. We're of the belief that kind of everything we're doing in Amazon is way more secure than we've ever been able to do internally. And I think as an example of that, if you, kind of, if you run uh, with uh, enterprise support uh, with Amazon, you have the ability to run uh, security tests on your platform. If you kind of look at that, what you're getting as a result and comparing to what you're able to do internally, I would imagine you would see quite a big difference. Attracting new talent. Attracting talent in financial services isn't as easy as it was before. We've got loads of legacy software. We have legacy platforms. We've invested heavily in the 80s and the 90s. People want to work with new technology. And we strongly believe that Amazon is one of those things which will help us attract more people because for the right reasons in terms of technology. Simplicity. If you're looking at all data centers, we, we're running, as I said, in multiple locations globally. Every single data center is different. There's a different version of the software. There's a different version of the infrastructure. Having the ability to do everything in the same kind of way in every single data center is one of the kind of the key enablers for us to move much, much faster. And it comes back to the agility again. Repeatability. When we're building data centers now, when we're building VPCs, it's always based on the same principle. It's automation. Everything we do is automated. If it's not automated, it doesn't go into Amazon. It's as simple as that. So if you don't script it, you don't migrate it. Lastly, but not least, cost. For us, cost is important but it's not the most important thing. If you're looking at kind of the, the, the spend that we're having at ICAP, we probably spend the same amount now as we did internally, but we do much, much more. We, we get many, many more servers. We may get many more services 
for the same cost that we spent historically in the internal data center. So what has ICAP done? We basically started about kind of early Q2 2015 to we made the decision we were going to migrate some of the, the main applications and we actually chose our most strategic and the kind of our biggest client facing application to be migrated. And as part of that we got direct connects in. We started as I said kind of early Q2. By June we kind of started development. Very very kind of quickly following that we did uh, the, the first production release in July. We introduced CloudFront and S3 and we uh, also migrated all our DNSs to Route 53 kind of allowing us to kind of set up global load balancing. Quickly kind of following that we had the, the migration of our DMZs. We introduced two new um, locations. We, we put our data center into Sydney and into Dublin. And historically we only run most of the applications out of a single data center. Kind of if you have a failure, kind of you have a catas catastrophe in terms of uh, being able to serve the client. Kind of fast forwarding again, kind of October, we migrated all of our DMZ. We migrated the whole uh, DMZ to Amazon and we turned off our internal data center. So all the connectivity for, uh, for our application now at that point went through uh, Amazon. I mentioned agility. At the same time as we moved to the DMZ to Amazon, we started a new project. And this was kind of late October 2015. By the time we hit kind of the first week of December, we released a brand new application, all built on Amazon services, no legacy software. And that's probably kind of the fastest ever in ICAP's history in terms of releasing an application. Since then, we've kind of gone through a lot of different things. We signed up for enterprise support. We set a world record in terms of the longest time to negotiate the enterprise agreement. I think we took nine months, which is quite an achievement, but it probably shows how conservative financial services is. But eventually we made it and now we're a very kind of good relationship with Amazon and they're supporting us on the journey. In recent weeks, we migrated one of our really, really kind of proper legacy trading applications and it's now running full in, in Amazon. So, this is where we got to, to this point. What's next? First, um, one of the kind of the great benefits of Amazon for us has been the ability to kind of spin up new applications and services very, very quickly. We've gone from kind of a few days and maybe sometimes weeks to less than 10 minutes. And that means deploying the application through kind of automation, using the DevOps function for what's, what it's worth, and then having everything deployed, infrastructure being provisioned, everything automatically. And that's quite a big kind of time saving and that's really where we're seeing one of the biggest benefits with Amazon. Because of the APIs and the interfaces that we're getting from Amazon, we can do things we were not able to do ever before. So next, Amazon for us is kind of our strategic partner when it comes to migrating every, every application we have. We have a cloud first strategy. Everything we're building now goes straight into the cloud. There's nothing that goes on premise. In terms of on premise, we have probably some of the most expensive data centers in the world. We're running a data center in Liverpool Street. Um, I would imagine the, the square footage price of that is quite high compared to um, Amazon's. By the end of this year, we want to have migrated every single front office application to the cloud. It's quite a large undertaking, but we would certainly believe that we're going to be able to do that. People talked about Brexit. Migrating to Amazon will allow us, when the point comes, we don't really have to worry about it anymore. If you want to deploy to Frankfurt, we can do that. We're already in Dublin. Really looking forward to London being kind of present, but it's like the point is, if we need to go to a new location in the past, that would have taken probably years probably a couple of years kind of finding the right location. Now it's at the fingertip of our DevOps team. Cost optimization. As I said, it's like it's not about kind of getting cheaper kit. It's about kind of getting the kit to work in a different way. And for us, we're running a 24, five and a half operation. And we basically kind of, we're not, we don't have to run anything during the weekend. So we can actually turn things off. 
when developers go home and their locations are brick in, why do we need to run the dev environment? Just doing that, we will save tons of money. Improving the developer experience. Kind of DevOps, developer experience is very, very important for us. People have talked about this previously as well. Using things like Workspace will enable us to kind of onboard the, the developer much quicker. As an example, we had a, a new start yesterday who's never worked in financial services in the past, and he was kind of he was shocked that we're having Windows machines. He was wondering where the where the Mac was and when he could start using uh, something he was used to. Workspace will allow us to do that. People can bring their own devices, even for developers. And then lastly, the most important thing for us going forward will be to have the ability to build systems and services that we only dreamt about in the past. It's like if you look at some of the, the services that we use, we use things like Redshift. We would never, ever build anything like that. And going forward, that will be one of the biggest things for us. We can build applications that the team has only dreamt about. And that's, that's the ICAP story. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bore. Super exciting to watch ICAP change the way they deliver technology towards their business. So in addition to thinking about where you might be in your journey, and how you can get to the next step. I thought I would spend just our last few minutes covering a few of the best practices that we've seen in organizations who are successful at using the cloud to transform their business. Now this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it will give you a sense of some of the things that we see organizations do that do this really well. First, they provide executive sponsorship. Projects in big companies are much more likely to succeed when the boss supports them. Transformation of any kind at the end of the day is really a leadership challenge. Good leaders will provide clarity of purpose to their teams and executive peers, help everybody understand where the organization is headed and why, communicate this over and over again to make sure that everybody understands, and not be afraid to make new rules along the way. Next, they provide opportunities for their staff to learn. Computer science fundamentals have not changed. It's just become easier to build large, scalable systems. Now, it's true that people can sometimes be afraid of what they don't know. And I've found that the best way to get them over their fears is to teach them what they don't know. My experience has been that attitude is just as important as aptitude. And everybody who wants to learn can be successful to propel, propel their careers forward. Next, start to think about how you can orient your organization more around experimentation. One of the changes that I was most proud about making at Dow Jones was the abolishment of our monthly capital committee reviews, where we would review projects that were going to cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, only to find out that by the time we got the infrastructure organized, the market moved on us, and that opportunity was no longer relevant. Having access to IT resources on demand that you can spin up and more importantly down when you're not using them will really change the way you can govern and allocate your budget and resources. We talked a lot about creating this cloud center of excellence. Consider how you can make this the fulcrum by which you create change and implement change across your organization. And last but not least, the ecosystem of digital consultancies and IT vendors that are delivering cloud-based solutions has evolved quite a bit in the last several years. Whether you'd like to work directly with a partner or indirectly through the AWS marketplace, there'll be plenty of opportunities for you to accelerate your initiatives on the AWS platform. For those interested in maybe learning a little bit more about these, I've written a number of blog posts about them on my best practices, uh, on these best practices, and, and recently I published an ebook on my blog that kind of wraps them all together in one. So as we close, I'd just like to ask everybody one more time, what if you could devote more of your resources to the things that matter and move faster while being more secure? This is what is compelling the enterprises that we speak with to move towards this cloud-first model, and is what caused Jim Fowler, the CIO of GE, to call out AWS as his trusted partner 
that's going to help him run his company for the next 140 years. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoy your lunch and the sessions. See you soon.